You know the bakery in Copenhagen where Marcus in the hit drama series The Bear learns the true art of pastry? You might have noticed the iconic logotype in the window. Is it a ghost or an octopus? Never mind. But that bakery certainly exists, and the man behind this beloved bread and pastry haven is Richard Hart, the man who introduced America to sourdough at iconic bakery Tartine in San Francisco, and the founder of Hart Bakery. I met him at Hart's newest location in Refn in Copenhagen, and we spoke about going from fine dining to sourdough, the mystery of wheat, and what it takes to bake the perfect loaf. My name is Sofie Settegren Bonnevere. This is Pop Foodie Radio. Okay, so we are at Hart Bakery's new location at Refn. Do you yeah. say Refn? Refn. Yeah, Refn. That's as good as I can do. I think yeah, it's yeah. Ref Shalun or yeah, but I, I can't I you would probably be better at saying I'm not that. I'm not gonna even try because mm. Danish So is... Refn is the best for yeah, us. Yeah. yeah. So uh Richard, you're the founder of Hard Bakery, of course, which is one of the world's best bakeries. Yeah. And you have how many locations do you have now? We have eight locations. Eight locations. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. In Denmark? In Copenhagen. In yeah. Copenhagen only. Yeah. And you're famous for your sort of cardamom croissants and your sourdoughs and what's yeah, more? Rye bread. Rye and, bread, yeah. Yeah, pastries and we started to move into sandwiches. And yeah. I find sandwiches fascinating because through years and years, we, you don't just make a sandwich. You uh, figure out what filling you want to make and then you design the bread around the filling, mm. which I think is quite an interesting way of looking at it. Yeah. Because most people just make a sandwich, but yeah. we're like, what is the per- what's the filling? And then what's the perfect bread that goes with that filling? Yeah. We'll and make what, that. according to you, what is the perfect it bread? It depends on what the filling is. If you've got a smoked salmon, you might want a bagel or a darker rye bread or mm. something like that. Or if you've got... A ham and cheese, you would have a baguette or yeah. like a toasted white bread sandwich. Or... Yeah, but also because you are the founder of Hart Bakery, but also you were the, the baker for, for Noma. But before... I wasn't the baker for Noma, oh, actually. No, no, like so I met Renee traveling around the world with Tartine. Mm. We met in Copenhagen and we met in Australia because mm. we went to do the Melbourne Food Festival Tartine. And Noma was doing a pop-up in Sydney at the time. Mm -hmm. And after our meal, Renee sat down with us and was like, do you know any bakers that would want to live in Copenhagen? At the time, I was like, no, man. Like, I don't want to live in Copenhagen. I was really happy in California. I loved working at Tartine. Mm. And you had been there for, like, what, seven years then? The total, I was there for seven years. Mm. So, like, this was probably at the five-year mark. Mm. And Tartine, of course, is the renowned bakery in San Francisco. Yeah, world famous. It went crazy there. But, like, it started moving in the direction that I didn't want to do in the end. And then I messaged Renee and said, are you still looking for that baker? And he was like, wow, I'm so happy to get your email. What do you want? And I said, I want a bakery in London and a bakery in Paris. Mm. And he said, well, come to Copenhagen, open one here, then you can go wherever you want. So I came here and moved to Copenhagen. And, and where are there. your Paris and London bakeries? I mean, maybe they're still coming. <laughs> yeah, they're coming. <laughs> they're coming. We got, yeah, yeah. we got plenty of time. Yeah. I don't plan on retiring, no. so like, we'll just keep. Who knows where we go? Yeah. But working at Tartine, I mean, you're sort of known for for teaching Americans about sourdough, how to bake with sourdough. Yeah. How did that happen? How did you get to Tartine? I was a chef for 12 years. I moved to California in my uh, late 20s and I carried on cooking for a year and a half. And then I I just happened across this bakery. I felt I had time. This was not Tartine. Uh, it was in the town where I lived and uh, they used to bake bread for the French Laundry, which is a famous yeah. restaurant in California. So I was like, wow, I have to check out this bakery. They used to make bread for the French Laundry. It must be this, like, amazing, like, I had no idea. I'd never been to a mm. bakery. I'd worked in fine dining restaurants before that. So I didn't really know what to expect, except for I had, in my imagination, it was going to be perfect in every way, like the French Laundry. Mm. And it was the polar opposite. Like, it was like a, a barn on a farm with two wood-fired ovens and chickens out the window and the California sunshine and tomatoes growing. And, like, it was the most amazing thing. But, like, it was 
two wood-fired ovens in this old wooden barn, mm. uh, and it felt like you could have been baking a thousand years ago. Like it was wood, you know, like it was fired by wood. It was like loaded by hand with these huge long peels. I just fell in love with it instantly. Like mm. I was, I couldn't believe how excited I was to see this like old world method. And was bread a thing for you already then, or did that love I mean, happen so, right like, there? You know, I've been trying to think about it because like I was so into food, so into cooking, and that doesn't come from my childhood. My, my I mean, we had shit food growing up mm. actually. Like not it, we. Where did my you grow fa- up? I grew up out just outside of London mm. in in mm. East London. Mm. And my parents were both working full time and there wasn't like this big food culture. Like Mm -hmm. we just, I think my mum just threw together a dinner every night, you know, and sometimes it was most vegetables were boiled for 20 minutes and like it was pretty grim, you know. So like I fell into food as I got older and absolutely loved the banter of a kitchen and being in the kitchen, the, the, the connection the chefs all had and. But looking back on bread, I always remember being a young kid and going to supermarket, crappy Sainsbury's or whatever it was, Mm -hmm. and picking up a warm loaf of bread and being like, wow. And like, there's this feeling behind warm bread that like Mm -hmm. every, all of us have, I think. What is it about it though? I don't know. It's just like, yeah, Yeah. comforting. It's amazing. It feels like a present. It's super exciting to have this smelling warm loaf of bread. And I mean, I have that memory of it but like the bread back then i was probably eating was terrible but like it was the warm bread is what makes it good you know i don't know so i was working i started working in that place in that barn and like it was a complete sidestep into a new career in a way because i'd worked in very fine dining fancy restaurants and then all of a sudden i'm like with a bunch of like pirates bakers who have covered in (laughs) tattoos and like listening to rock and roll music all mm. day and then you know it was very different from being in a fine dining kitchen i remember the first day i was like but where's the yeast and they're like this is the yeast and oh, it was sourdough. Yeah, sourdough and i didn't even know what fucking sourdough was no. you know like i was this was my early 30s so this was 16 years ago yeah like i must have been 30 when i walked in there mm. so like I had no clue. I didn't know anything about bread. And it was quite an amazing world to step into. And I became obsessed very fast. Mm. So the owner, she was 65 and she started the company when she was 50. Mm. And like she was very obsessive and she saw something in me and we would sit down and talk. She would give me all her bread books and I was just like soaking it all in, you know. And I would go to every bakery I could on my day off and travel around and taste bread. And this was before I even really knew what Tartine was. It was kind of before they was at their famous stage. Yeah, Yeah. Mm -hmm. and um, so one day I I went to Tartine to buy a loaf of bread and Mm -hmm. I took it back to Kathleen, the owner, and she was like, wow, doesn't this make you green with envy? Mm -hmm. And like... (laughs) I was amazed by this loaf of bread. Like it, it, it tasted so much different from anything I'd ever tasted. It, what like, was it about it? What was it that tasted differently? Was it the, the, the texture? texture? The texture mm. was different. The the crust, the crumb, the the structure, and maybe I've blown it up into my head to be something more than it yeah. is. To mm. you know, maybe if I was to go back in time to that day and look at it, I might not be as impressed as I no. am today. No. But like this memory of it was like, wow, this is like. By this stage, I'd been baking for maybe a year and a half. Mm. So I felt like I knew a bit. Like I'd been baking solidly at this place. With this plate. sourdough. Yeah, yeah, and at this place, like we baked all day and all night. Like we started really early. It was a long, grueling day. And mm. we made 1,200 loaves a day. It was a ton of bread. Mm. So I felt like I knew something. But I had no idea what they were doing to make this bread. And I mean... Now I very much understand. Like they what had, a, was it? They, well, they had a very small production. They could focus solely on the bread. They didn't, you know, like when you make twelve hundred loaves of bread, you're kind of governed by like how long it takes to, you know, you're governed by a routine. You have to do it at that time, mm. otherwise you're not going to make it through the day. Mm. Uh, and at Tartine, when I got there, we made one hundred and fifty loaves of bread a day, mm. and it, it was almost boring. Like there was almost not enough to do. You know, yeah. like we didn't make enough bread, and like slow baking. Yeah, very mm. like to go from twelve hundred to one hundred and fifty. It was crazy, but like they baked by complete what the bread needed by feel, not by routine, not by mm. not by mixing by numbers, not by like doing everything the same. It was like. What does the bread need today? It sounds a bit hippie, but yeah, like but it was every on its own, everything right? yeah, needed yeah. something else. And like the weather would be slightly different. So you would adjust slightly or you would, you know, you do little tweaks. So it was li- literally 
the bread at Tartine was driven by what the dough needed. Mm. And like we it was constantly assessed day after day. And I mean all of all bakeries do this, but like it was it was very we were all very, very obsessed and like try searching for a perfect loaf there. Have you made the perfect loaf? I mean, it's quite funny because I, yeah, I think I've made a perfect loaf, but very rarely. Mm, how often? Two times a year. Two times a year. Three yeah. times a year. And what about all the other loaves? Are they just good. okay? Good. They're, they're good. good bread. They're good, yeah. Sometimes they're not good, but yeah. generally they're good. Mm. Sometimes they're not good. Mm. And then I don't know whether the planets are aligned or what it is, but there's a day when you hit everything completely correctly mm. and like the texture, the taste, the fermentation, the every part of it is exactly perfect. And you can tell the bread looks amazing. It's huge. Like it's almost like when it was a raw dough to when it's fully baked, it's turned like, I don't know, five times bigger than yeah. what it was. And like, It makes the texture unbelievable, yeah. and like the is the weather important for? Because I, I realized when I when I was uh, experimenting with sourdough, we had like a thunderstorm coming in, and the dough was just perfect. Everything in that process with that yeah. bread was the most perfect bread I've ever baked. I mean, it was perfect for that moment for mm. where you were, what the flour you were using, mm. like the perfect is. is That moment in that time, like your sourdough is exactly right. The weather is totally important. Like mm. The temperature, the humidity, the... As a baker, like, I think your first thing to do is to read your room. Mm. Are you cold? Are you warm? Okay, Are yeah. you, how do you feel? Mm. Is the room cold? You know, if the room's cold, your sourdough's cold. Your dough could be cold. Like, it, sourdough's a living thing. It needs to be warm. Mm. Is that what is fascinating about it as well for you? Was that the sort of the thing you fell in love with that is actually something living and that you can sort of experiment with or what was it? I mean, that also of... my mum turning from a chef to a baker, my mum was like, you're going to be so bored. Like you have all these ingredients and now you have no ingredient. Like no. you go from every ingredient to four ingredients and I've never been so challenged. Like, and I'm still so excited to get up at 4am and come to work. Oh, which you is do? You still today. do that? Today, like mm. I was up at 4am yesterday, I was up at 4am and I'm so excited to come to work and I'm like, I wonder how the bread's going to be today. <laughs> you know, it's kind of crazy because yeah. also I'm not like the the owner and the founder that just comes in and says, hi, guys, how's it going? See you later. Like, mm. I come in and I make dough. Like, yeah. I make the bread. Like, yeah. I, I've been making dough every day. Like, and I don't think I'm ever going to stop. Yeah. <laughs> like, I love it. Like, But you actually started something, at least like in Copenhagen, where where sort of there's a lot of good like bakeries now and a lot of sourdough bakeries and stuff. It's huge now. Yeah. It's become super huge. Yeah. But in, in the States, it's still the bread sort of culture is still quite poor, right? I mean, is it is and it well? isn't. Like, mm. I almost believe, like, America and Tartine, I think, started something. Mm. Like, with Definitely, Chad's book, yeah. with... And, you know, the whole world became sourdough enthusiasts. Everyone, you know, like if you, so many people own Tartine's bread book because mm. like we all was like, what's the answer? What's the key? Yeah. How do you make that bread? You know, like, so I think America was, there was a time when France, everyone was looking at France at the bread. And I think that was around the 70s and stuff. Mm. And uh, a lot of American bakers were trying to meet this guy called Lionel Poilain, who was a Parisian French baker mm. who was like everyone thought he was the guy mm. he's not around anymore but like so there's a lot of stories of American bakers going there and learning about wood-fired ovens and baking sourdough bread and then I think America was first mm. like they were ahead of everyone yeah when I was there I think I was in the right place at the right time yeah probably, yeah. yeah yeah and then yeah. um I mean coming to Copenhagen I mean, at the time, there was, like, two bakeries, you know. There was a bakery. Yeah. Had you Went, been to Copenhagen before once. then? Yeah, okay. Once for mm. three days. So okay. it was strange. Not strange, but, like, you know, to move your whole life to somewhere after only spending three days somewhere was a bit yeah. crazy. But and like, you had kids as well? Or? Kids, yeah. yeah. Well, my ex-wife and my kids, we all moved here. My two oldest kids went to Danish school, actually. Mm. But, like, the two oldest kids were speaking Danish, and it was crazy. Yeah. Yeah, they're back in the States now. Yeah. When did you know that Hot Bakery was a success, which you can say today that it is? Because how many locations do you have now? Yeah. Um, eight? Yeah, we have eight locations. Eight locations. When did you know that this is, wow, this is a 
thing? I mean, I don't know, actually. We were popular. Like, we had a following. Like,、mm-hmm. um, a lot of people would come. Like, I would see chefs. Quite famous chefs come to the bakery, and、mm-hmm. so maybe that was it, that was it、mm-hmm. you know, like、um, word of mouth. Yeah, yeah, people come in, you know, like Copenhagen for a long time has been a food place, so、yeah. everyone comes to Copenhagen to eat, and like they generally do the rounds of Noma and a, a few of the other、mm-hmm. restaurants, and they would all come to Hart. Yeah. But did the Noma get the bread from Hart as well? Did they? they so Noma the got from, my bread. Yeah, so, yeah. like, you originally said I was Noma's baker. So,、mm. I wasn't actually Noma's baker. I met Renee、mm. a couple of times and then I ended up, he, we decided to partner on a project and、mm. come, came to Copenhagen. And then I spent th- maybe three or four months in, at Noma.、Mm. Uh, I don't know if you've been, but、oh, like、yeah. they have these greenhouses.、Mm. We turned one of those greenhouses when they first got moved to that space into a test bakery. So I worked out there for four months testing products before Heart Bakery opened.、Oh, wow. So that's the only real like, thing I've had with Nomo, Nomo except、yeah. for like, meeting Renee a couple of times. He took a big gamble on bringing me here. Yeah, so it was more like been... a partnership. Then, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it was just it was a partnership and he, he had faith in where I had come from, but we、mm. really. Really didn't know each other very well. So, what was it that he saw in you? Do you know? I mean, maybe Tartine. I don't know. Like, yeah, Tartine probably, was a huge yeah. success. Yeah. I was the head baker.、Mm. Maybe he liked me from us talking. I'm、mm. not sure. I、mm. saw my enthusiasm.、Mm. Um, but I don't know. Like, so coming here and opening this with them, I mean, that was a big part of like joining my past with my new future partners was a nice. Partnership, you know,、mm. Tartine to Noma.、Mm. And then I'm driven and I want to work and I come to work. And, you know, I think people like that, like、mm. my staff like that. So、mm. I think it was, that's partly to do with the success too, the、mm. fact that I'm always here. And, and what、bread. about the bread? I mean, people have made sour bread before,、uh, yeah. sour dough bread. What is it about the bread you're baking here? Is it This is like, quite interesting, is, actually,、yeah. because I, I, when I first. Came, I was nervous. Before I had signed the deal, I spoke to Renee and I said, Look, I need to talk to you about this because this could mean maybe I don't come.、Mm-hmm. Uh, I said, Look, Noma, I understand, is Scandinavian only cuisine. You only use anything from the local area. I don't think I can make my bread using Scandinavian wheat. And why was that? Is that, is that is the Scandinavian、uh, so wheat? So I make bread that needs, so my flour needs to have a certain strength. In the, in the wheat itself, in the protein content,、mm. uh, so it can hold up to a long fermentation at a warmer temperature. So, is that a high protein level? Higher protein、need? flour, but it also needs something,、uh, a, it also needs a high falling number.、Mm. A high falling number, I don't want to get too technical because it's boring, but like a high falling number means that the wheat can hold up to a long fermentation before the gluten starts to degrade. Okay. So, I was making bread in California, and that's the bread I love. Like,、yeah. there's really good, strong wheat in America, but also, high falling number comes from like the field, the grain not be, having too much grain during its growing period.、Mm. If the grain gets too wet throughout its growing period,、uh, it ends up being quite soft. Okay.、Uh, and therefore, it ferments very fast. So, when it's ground to a flour, The sourdough and bacteria in a sourdough、mm. starter, the yeast and bacteria can feed a lot faster. It's like a feeding frenzy. They、yeah. can, the guys can go crazy.、Mm. And、uh, at warmer temperatures, the gluten starts to degrade before you've even gone through the bulk fermentation, which affects everything, actually. It gives you a more leathery crust and. Yeah, it affects everything. So, you were used to using American, American wheat. American wheat, and、yeah. it's not that I was only used to that. Like, I can adapt and make、mm. different breads, but sourdough bread in the style of tartine, I believe, needs to be made using that style.、Mm. And now everyone in the world is making that style of bread or trying to make that style of bread, but like, I think to get it spot on,、mm. What you're looking for is a medium to high protein content and a very high falling number.、Mm. So you mix the dough、mm. with a young sourdough, like it's been freshly fed, it's not too acidic. You mix the dough,、uh, you keep it warm around about 28 degrees, which is perfect for yeast expansion, yeast growth. 
uh, and then about four hours later you divide it you shape it you put it in baskets and then you put it in a fridge that's set between 10 and 12 degrees celsius mm. and you do that because at that stage it slows the fermentation but it doesn't stop it a four or five degree fridge which a lot of bakeries and a lot of chefs and a lot of restaurants do stops bacterial growth and it stops fermentation mm. Fridges are designed to completely stop any bacteria growing. That's why they're designed. Mm. You know, we have fridges to keep our food from spoiling. Yeah. But fermentation stops at that temperature. But as a baker, you want fermentation. Mm. So basically, you the, the beginning of the bread making process, you're promoting heavy yeast growth. So the yeast are full and abundant in this loaf of bread. And then when you go and put it in the fridge... You slow it down, but that's when all the bacterial flavors, sourness notes and stuff start coming into play. Mm. Uh, and if you put it into a four degree fridge, you lose the opportunity to make all that flavor and you end up getting a kind of one dimensional tasting bread. Mm. My, this is my yeah, opinion. Yeah, yeah. I mean, everyone has their own idea mm. of what good bread is. This is my opinion mm. and my bread. So like I think my style of bread needs, it can't be made with Danish wheat. It can't be made with English wheat. It can't be made with... Uh, Scandinavian wheat. And I know a lot of bakers here who are making similar looking breads to mine, mm. but they ferment it very cold and then they put it in a cold fridge because otherwise the sourdough goes too fast, the gluten degrades and the bread ends up flat and a mess. Mm. So they keep it really cold, but I believe personally that that lacks a lot of flavour that you could be getting because mm. I like to make bread using fermentation. and it's, it's about tasting the wheat, but not only the wheat. You need mm. to taste the other complexities in the fermentation and stuff. so where do you get your wheat from now where do you i am what buying kind of... wheat from italy and from france okay so when i first got here I, a friend of mine introduced me to a baker and chef in italy called gabriel bonci he's mm. a pizza master he's like very famous in rome uh and he took me to a farm and mill two hours two and a half hours from rome in the region called the Marche. and like uh this guy was growing He said it was 2,000 varieties of wheat in one field. Now, I don't know whether that's an exaggeration or what, but, like, the field was abundant and beautiful. Mm. And there was many, many varieties in this one field. And I'd never seen anything like it. Like, I always thought wheat was grown for, for as a monocrop, really. Mm. Like, the strongest one wins, you know, the one that yields the most wins. That's yeah. the one they plant. So, like, to be in this field that was, like, Every type of wheat you could get your hand on, completely different looking heads of wheat. Yeah. It was amazing, like loads of butterflies and. Then and are they quite high? Yes, they all they different. Grow, yeah, all different. Yeah. It was fascinating. So they get different yeah. temperatures. Yeah, and it's and good for the soil because mm. they has different yeah. like uh, root systems yeah. and stuff. So um, basically, the, it was the son that came up with. So like, it's a family mill and farm, and there's a, the grandma the father and the son and the father is it's the name of his meal is um paolo mariani mm. and the son danny mariani he's the one who came up with the idea and the father gave him an acre of land to test this idea mm. and he planted an acre of mixed wheat in the field and the dad's like you just fucked up an acre so of my he land. just he just threw yeah, it yeah, threw the it seeds in. away yeah so i get there the year after that with gabriel bonchi mm. so they had one acre of test flour and mm. seeds that they replanted because mm. they thought it was good. Mm. So they replanted much more than one acre. I get there and then we see the fields and I bake with the bread and it's like my dream wheat. Wow. It's like my fucking yeah. dream wheat. It's like a medium protein, about 12.5% yeah. protein, really high falling number, probably 450 And, like, it is literally my dream. I go and bake bread with it, and the bread comes out fucking amazing. And I'm like, oh, my God, mm. this wheat is... So, like, Gabrielle Bonchi and I leave, and we go to go back to Rome. And on the way home, I'm like, shit. Like, my bakery wasn't even open yet. We're building it, but it's not open yet. So, on the way back, I'm like, look, I call Danny, and I'm like, look, I need to buy this wheat. Whatever you can sell me, I will buy whatever you can sell me. And he's like, let me do my math. I'll work it out and, like, tell you what I've got and, like... He came back to me and said, like, I've got 30 tons. I can sell, like, 10 tons to you, 10 tons to Bonchi, and then I'll split up the other 10 tons to other people. So I bought 10 tons of this wheat, and then it gets to Copenhagen, and I'm in the test bakery, and I test a batch of it. It's not the same wheat anymore. 
Oh no, because of the transportation. Because it's changed. Yeah. No, no, it's no. just changed. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because, because like the first, the first year. The first year was my perfect yield, but then ah. this is just a mixture of wheat. Yes, yeah, it's so, unpredictable. So in the next year, it came up really high for really high protein. So like I made the same dough, the same bread, but it just didn't blow up. It just stayed really tight mm. and like it was so strong, it wouldn't go any further. So I realized I needed to blend it and I needed some softer wheat. Uh, so someone introduced me to a miller in outside of Paris and they had a lot softer wheats and like they had a real long tradition with milling and I met the head miller and felt like I was having a conversation with a kindred spirit. He was mm. very obsessed mm. with milling. Uh, it was very interesting talking to him because he was like, ah, and I was like, well, you are crazy, man, mm. but I love you for it. So I bought, started buying flour from them also and I blended it and to get the bread that I make today, yeah. And that's what you still yeah, do? Yeah, I still use both their wheats. Mm. I have a relationship with both of them. Yeah. I've been to their farms and I've been to their mills. And But it's called something, isn't it? Like a way of farming when you just sort of uh, toss it out yeah, and they grow in different, yeah. And sort of the problem, of course, is that it's so unpredictable. Yeah, yeah. But the good thing, it's good for the it's land. It's good for the land. Yeah, it's, it's good for like the soil. It's yeah. so lovely. Mm. Honestly, like it was a paradise. Yeah. It was such an amazing field. And apparently like there's... A mountain range 20 miles this way and there's the sea 20 miles this way and it creates this perfect microclimate for growing wheat mm. there and I mean it was just such a lovely place and the people were so passionate and lovely but that kind of flower you can't you, can, you can buy it like in store like if I want to develop my sourdough yeah. baking what kind of flower I mean you could I be get? friends with me and then I can give you flour I'll try yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, the original space it was mm. really lovely because there was a big hole in the wall and people would come in and I could like talk to people and people would ask me advice about their bread and you know they would ask for sourdough and mm. I would give them sourdough and I would give them flour even I would mm. be like here you go like try this go you know like I'm super interested in helping people be better bakers mm. so like I'm not scared to give away sourdough or flour or what or advice or tips mm. or anything so but for a while we were selling the wheat but like I don't think it ever really worked out like we'd we sold it for a bit because I, I, it's the same question. Where do I get it? Yeah. And so we sold it for a while and we haven't done for a little while. Maybe we should revisit that. You should. Yeah. 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 Because it's, it's a nice, because there's a lot of home bakers there and they just can't get the stuff. Like no. if you go to the supermarket, here, there is a lot of flour, but like there's nothing to that type of flour. No, like it's, it's also so processed, like some of the, yeah, to get the high yeah. proteins in there. And in Mexico, to cut to that quickly like mm. the mexican wheat is not good like they don't have a big wheat growing culture and what they do use is like completely highly processed full of additives full of like mm. dough strengtheners and stuff and it's not the type of wheat i want to use no you know? like so i'm gonna start using the wheat that i used in tartine okay yeah okay. yeah because you you just got married yeah to henrietta yeah, love yeah, a yeah. red tea lady yeah, yeah. Uh, lucky me. Yes, lucky you. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. And you moved to Mexico. We moved to Mexico. Yeah. The reason being, I have my children in California. My ex-wife and I broke up a lot of years ago now, mm. but like um, that's where they were from and she moved them back there. And so my career was going amazingly and then my home was yeah. empty and a bit broken and uh, really tough trying to figure out what to do to go from being a full-time dad to being and not being a dad. You yeah. know, like I saw... I was flying to California three times a year from Copenhagen and didn't feel like a solution. It didn't feel like I couldn't figure out how to go forwards. So then I had to turn around to my partners and say, well, actually, I'm going to leave Copenhagen and I'm going to move to Mexico. And they were like, what? And why Mexico? What? Why didn't you move to California? You know, I lived in America for 11 years. Mm. I left when Trump became the president. Yeah. Couldn't wait to get back to Europe. And just don't want to live in America again. Mm. Like, I I mean, I, it would make so much more sense because my kids are there mm. and I could be in their lives more. But like, I mean, where would I open a bakery? Like San Francisco has a ton of bakeries. And to be honest, it's kind of, I go there every month to see my kids. I feel like San Francisco is on a huge decline. Mm. Like it, like the place is, feels like it's falling apart a bit. Mm. It's a and rich man, rich man's playground. A rich man's uh, playground. Yeah. And then there's poor people living in tents mm. all over the place. Mm. Like it's, 
very, very disturbing spot actually now. So then, okay, I don't want to live in San Francisco. I don't want to be a small town baker. I want to be a big town baker. Mm. Uh, I don't want to live in Los Angeles. Don't know if you've been there, but yeah. I've been there a few mm. times. And I, every time I'm like, I don't really get it. Like it confuses <laughs> yeah, me. <I> know. <laughs> yeah. So I don't want to live in Los Angeles. I don't want to live in California. And I've been to Mexico quite a few times. And I felt like I could live there. Like I mm. love the food scene. I feel like it feels like... When I moved to Copenhagen, a hugely up and coming food scene. Mm. And I think the city kind of feels like a beautiful European city. Like Mexico's really lovely place to live. Mm. Nice climate, lovely people. They've got beautiful hearts. Mm. Uh, I can't speak Spanish yet. And I've been trying. Like I lived in Denmark for six yeah, years. I, was say, I speak zero Danish, Danish nothing. <laughs> no. I know like five words or something. Yeah. Um, but like I've been really trying to learn Spanish. I've mm. been studying three lessons a week for, oh, a, whole, wow. for a whole year oh, that's and I still don't have it oh, no. like I, I I feel like I'm two years old yeah and I can understand what my mum and dad are saying but I'm not ready to talk no, back to them no. yet. <laughs> yeah but so now you're opening a bakery in Mexico Yeah, yeah, we're opening a bakery in Mexico. That. Okay, so we're going to call it Green Rhino, which is a strange name. Uh, actually, like it was going to be called 77, which is my birth year, and it never sounded right. Mm -hmm. We did the branding, we drew like punk rockers and like 77 and all these like, because that was the time of punk rock. And then everyone was like, well, you're not actually punk rock. And I was like, you're right. It didn't quite fit. The no. whole thing just didn't quite fit. And my third son, who's always been obsessed with rhinos and the color green, was like, call it green rhino. So I was like, okay. It's beautiful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, okay. Yeah. Like I have a tattoo of his drawing on my wrist that he did when he was five and he's now 11. And yeah. so, you know, green rhino really means something to him. Mm. And like he's since I, I've done that, he's been so proud and he's so excited that it's uh, his name. What's his name? And his name's Jude. Yeah. And uh, he's been drawing me rhinos pretty much every day. Like he drew me uh, a tiger rhino, uh, a bread rhino, like <laughs> like these just crazy concept rhinos. Yeah. And I'm like, wow, I love it. You're so creative. Like a, a rhino shape with a space scene in the actual body. And well, like, that's a logotype. Yeah, 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 of course. Like, And I was like, well, maybe I'll make T-shirts out of your pictures, dude. Mm. He's like, yeah, you should, but you'll have to give me 50%. <laughs> I'm like, what? Uh, 50%? <laughs> yeah, so yeah. that's going to be the bakery. I'm going to open the world's best bakery in Mexico yeah, City. That's uh, so exciting. Uh, And is uh, it going to be a, a sit-in bakery? Like you can come Actually, for... it's going to be a sit-out bakery. Like there's a yeah, lot of seating outside. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's no seating inside because mm. I kind of swallowed it all up with production space. Mm. But there's quite a lot of seats outside for it. Um, it's in an old house. And where in Mexico is it? It's in Mexico City mm. in an area called Palenco. Going to make... Uh, I don't really know. Like The last two weeks I've been like, you know what, I'm going to make something. I'm not going to make this city sourdough loaf of bread. I'm not going to make that anymore. Oh, you're not? I don't know. Like no. I've got this idea yeah. that I should move into a new a new thing yeah. you know like something new and maybe it's a sourdough loaf but not this like white sourdough loaf that everyone kind of eats and wants maybe it should just be something completely different what would that be do you have any clues <sighs> no I started thinking about adding corn in different creation you know mm. not corn flour not whole pieces of corn but like maybe adding some corn somehow I don't know like mm. Because there's a lot of corn tons, in Mexico. Tons they have of yeah. beautiful corn. And like, their tortilla breads are so different yeah, than the yeah, ones yeah. you even get in, yeah. in, um, in yeah. California. Yeah, yeah so really I good. think like, I think I'd need to rethink things a little bit yeah. and just, you know, keep it fresh and keep it exciting. And, you know, like I want to do something, do something new. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So what is the bread culture in Mexico apart from tortillas? Like how do they... I mean, eat most bread? people in Mexico eat sweet breads. They call yeah. it bread, but it's more like cakes and pastries. Yeah. You know, they call everything like a croissant is bread. So yeah. they call it sweet breads. And that, that is very popular. And sandwich breads at the moment are not. Mm -hmm. And I guess like when you think about it, it's quite obvious because their version of a sandwich is a taco. Mm. Everyone eats tacos. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. the sandwich. That's, you know, yeah. like that is their sandwich. Mexican sandwich. Yeah, it yeah. is. So like they don't really eat that many sandwiches, although... That's kind of changing. There's a couple of bakeries there that are doing very well and are popular and selling mm. bread, but not to the scale of Copenhagen. No. So like, but 
maybe they just haven't had the right bread yet, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. So yeah. I remember when we got here, like, it was interesting having conversations with Renee and he's like, what the Danish people think of as bread is rye bread. Mm. And that was hard for me to wrap my head around because I was like, what? You know, because I didn't know really a thing about rye bread when I moved here. Like, we tried to sell it in in San Francisco and we maybe sold 10 loaves a week. Like, it yeah. was not popular. Yeah, and they're not used to that. So then to, to come here food. and then to try and rewire your head. Like, if, if you talk to a Danish person of, about bread, they in their head, they're visioning rye bread. They're mm. not thinking about sourdough loaves or white bread. or you No. Know. It was quite funny. So, like... Be interesting to see Mexico, like because they also they don't really have much of a bread culture. They make tortas on these white, ugly rolls that are pretty cheap, industrially yeah. made. When are you opening? Summer. Summer. Okay. It's a okay, shame actually because so I really want to be in Copenhagen in the summer. Yeah. Because last year I didn't get here in the summer, and Copenhagen is the best country in the world in the summer. It is. It it's is. It's amazing. Mm. Like the going swimming everywhere yeah. the daytime goes on forever mm. everyone comes out of hibernation and is outside mm. and so fuck i really want to be here in summer but i don't think i'm going to be able no. to so like i imagine we're going to open in summer we're building right now and we got held up for a month because like we got closed down by the city and we had to pay them some money oh, okay was... yeah <laughs> some issues apparently how it works in yeah. mexico yeah. you know you can pay your way out of things so we did yeah yeah so and you also have a book coming out i do yeah, yeah i so do what's it about and when is it it's, out <laughs> <laughs> it's about bread obviously mm. it's about only bread mm. there's no cakes or anything like that in it it's literally just bread i think if one day we do a cake book we might do a heart bakery book or something mm. richard heart bread it's going to be called it's about everything i know to date about everything i have all the information i have trying to get it out of my head into a piece of paper mm. um Trying to be as explanatory as possible, you know, without being boring or mm. without like driving, making people go boss eyed. I have a ton of bread books and a lot of them I can't read because they I just find them so boring, mm. you know, and mm. so technical. And so they just don't go in. Like, mm. so I tried to be able to imagine we were having a conversation and I was teaching you to make bread and we were side by side. I've tried to do that in a book and hopefully that works. Mm. I have uh, QR codes for shaping techniques and mm. stuff, for some mixing techniques, because another thing that drives me crazy about bread books up to date is when you have a series of still photos about shaping a loaf of bread. Yeah. I find them so confusing. Yeah, As a confusing. brand new baker, you have no idea no. because it's such a fluid movement yeah. when it comes to shaping bread. Yeah. Unless you actually see the movement, You don't get it. No. So like that's a very good point. I'm looking forward to this yeah. book because I can't. I can never quite get it. I, yeah. I look at the pictures and it doesn't look like the same as it the pictures. It doesn't look do the it. same. No. So no. if you can watch, so like on the QR code, it will take you to a website and then that will have the instruction and the video. So you can just watch over and over and mm -hmm. like hopefully that 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 will be good. And when will this be out? Comes out on the fifth of November. Fifth of November. Comes out on November. I think we'll probably do a book launch here mm. in November because I'm due to be in Europe around about then. Mm. So hopefully we'll do a book launch here at yeah. our bakery. Yeah, it comes out then. But that's in the states. But hopefully we can get some copies over here. Yeah, for that. I'll try to yeah. get on that email. Yeah, list. yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, um, Richard, when you're in Copenhagen, uh, you're here with your wife now for a few few yeah. weeks. Or yeah, yeah, days? I've been yeah. here for three weeks. Three weeks. Yeah. So, uh, where do you go? Where do you go for dinner? Where do you go for coffee? Uh, except for Hard Bakery, of course. Yeah. I mean, last night we went to Popple. Yeah, that's good. Have you been Noma, there? Yeah, Noma's Burger is yeah, I mean, it's but wonderful. Shit, man, it's got so, so good like, yeah. lately. And the like, sides are The sides are better. Yeah. The sides blow your mm. mind. They're so good. Last yeah. night we had salads and asparagus and all these dishes that were like, shit. Like, mm. they were so good. Even yeah. the kids loved it. Everyone, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so went there last night. There's a place that I go to every time I come back. It's called Maison. I mean, it's very fancy. Yeah, look, Talia just stuck her nose up in yeah, the air. But like, it's kind a... of. Have you ever? I don't know if you've ever been there. It's French. No. It's a French bistro-ish type food, uh, but it's done very well. It's classic, but man, like by the end of it, you feel a bit heart attacky, you oh, know, because yeah. it's very buttery. rich and buttery yeah, and yeah. French. Uh, Scandinavian food tends to be quite buttery. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. 
Where else did I go? Oh, I went, also went to an ex-Noma chef's restaurant called Iluka. Mm. I really like to go there. I find him very innovative. Mm. Very delicious seafood and fish. Super good. I go, mm. I've been going there. And Fisker Bar, we went there for oysters. And for coffee, probably Prologue. Like, okay. That's the only one I've been to, actually. They have their own uh, yeah, coffee, coffee shops. shops. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. do, mm. yeah. Did you oh, drink coffee? Oh, and yeah. went to another place called... <laughs> Good question, yeah. though. I went to a place called uh, Posh Jar. Posh Jar, a G- restaurant. J-A-H. Okay. The, we used to go to the their first restaurant called Izakaya Jar. It's near, uh, it's in Vestabro. They've just opened one in the center, and it has more sushi and stuff. It's the uh, Japanese-style yeah. great sake, like... Mm. Henry as she loves sake. So coffee. Yes, I drink coffee every because day. Because you married the, I the married tea, the lady. tea lady. Yeah, so. I drink coffee every day and I mm. also like give her my dark coffee. Oh, you do. So she drinks coffee she as well. She drinks coffee too. Yeah. But I mean, it's quite funny because like years ago, I have a friend who wrote a, sh- a cookbook. He has a restaurant in London called Black Axe Mangal and mm. he wrote a cookbook. It's called, also called Black Axe Mangal. And he wrote about me in there because I helped him with his bread. And he put... And one of the things is like, Rich loves tea. Like, mm-hmm. he comes to my house, all he wants to do is drink tea. This is long, long before, like, I was with the tea lady. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we drink coffee and tea. We yeah. do both. I mean, they're both good. What's your favorite tea from Henrietta's brand? Yeah, I mean, I like something. She has a milk oolong. Yeah. Which yeah. I'm super into. Perfect with pancakes. Really? Yeah. Okay. Perfect pairing. Okay. Yeah. I'm very into it. I really love that at the moment. There's another one called Waikato Black. Mm-hmm. It's a, a black tea from New Zealand, um, which is a strange place for gross tea, uh, but like it's really amazing. Uh, very biscuity and kind of reminds me of a fresh, freshly baked biscuit yeah. when you drink it. Yeah, Sounds yeah. lovely. So good. Yeah. I mean, I love It's hard to say. Like we drink, we're we're actually very spoiled. We're so rich in tea. We've got every type yeah, of tea. You I can, can imagine. imagine. Yeah. Do you bake bread at home? No, you don't. I mean, no. I don't really need to. Like no. I, in a bake, like it's not because I don't want to. I cook at home yeah. all the time. Yeah, but like the it's difficult at home with your home oven and stuff. If you have a roaring bread oven in your bakery, that's what I suspected. Like, yeah, you need the yeah. yeah. You, well, it just works better. Mm. I mean, you yeah. can bake bread at home, and mm. like in. In Mexico, because I haven't had a bakery in Mexico, I don't have it yet. Mm. I have made some bread at home, but I haven't made like sourdough breads. I've been making like tin loaves. I've been making rye bread. I've been making like some wheaty like pan sandwich square yeah. breads. I feel like they do better at home than like yeah. a, a kind of sourdough style loaf. Can you get that? What is it? What's the term for um, for that brownish sort of? Uh, um, Crust on the bread. What's it called? Yeah. Mel- Mel- Ma- Mayard reaction, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. What is that? And can you get it at home? Uh, you can you totally need... get it. Yeah. Of How course do you, you do can it? get it. Like your best to use like a Dutch oven of some sort. Mm. You bake at home? Yeah. Yeah, your best to use like a Le Creuset pot or a uh, something like that. Yeah. Wait, there's one here. Let me just... Oh, look at that. I got one of those. But like I don't... It's a Le Creuset. It could be anything. Yeah. But like a, a cast iron... Whether it's enameled or not makes no difference. But cast iron, yeah, it holds heat ridiculously. Yeah. So you warm it up in the, you heat it up in the oven for an hour or so, mm. and this thing is then radiant hot. I want to show you because there's mm. a better way of doing it. Mm. So because it's so thick and heavy, mm. it holds its heat really well. I take this off mm. because this doesn't go into the oven. Although this is metal, it doesn't matter. Mm. But normally, I take this off and use this as the bottom. So I oh, take the, right. I, I use, the, I put my bread on here. On the lid. Yeah, yeah. on the lid. So mm. I put the lid. So basically, I pull the whole thing out of the oven. Mm. I put the lid down. I turn my bread out of the basket. I score it, mm. and then I put this on top like this as the, the bottom oh. goes on as the lid. So the Le Creuset pan is like, it's upside, upside down. Upside down. Yeah, and you put it yeah. in the oven like that. Yeah, that's how it goes in the oven. Because like, if you do it the other way, I always feel like it's, if you try and drop the bread into a scalding hot pan, yeah, you're going to burn your fingers or it doesn't feel right or yeah. you're going to damage the bread. 
the importance of using this is it mimics an oven inside your oven. Yeah. So your home oven is designed to let the steam out. Like yeah. home ovens are designed not to hold any steam. Yeah. In bread, you need steam. Mm. When you bake bread, you really need steam. Mm. And if you don't have steam, your bread doesn't rise properly. Mm. Because like the bread hits the oven and it dries out instantly and that's as far as it would go. If it's moist in the oven while it's expanding, it will grow to its full potential. Mm. Once the colour starts coming, it's grown to its full potential. Mm. But before that, you want a lot of moisture in mm. there. So this traps all wow, the Wow, so, that's such a good tip. So but, this traps all the moisture yeah. inside because your bread has moisture inside it all the water inside the dough yeah so as it bakes the moisture escapes from the dough inside this dome that it has nowhere to escape to mm. so it keeps so the moisture in. in there so after 20 minutes or so it's risen to its full potential yeah. you take the lid off you let the crust color and yeah. go to the color you want which is the maillard and you don't need any any fat or oil or anything to no no, no, it, no won't it works stick. perfectly yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. is this going to be in the book it is yeah 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 it's in the book yeah this is how you would bake a sourdough look and this hole here from this thing doesn't matter because the bread goes on top and it seals it anyway yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. completely oh, that's, that's so the best great. way to do it yeah i'm gonna ask you seven quick questions Seven? I thought we've had tons of questions. <laughs> we had tons of questions, yeah. but those are the quick questions. Okay. Um, so, best topping on a sandwich right now? Ham, cheese and mustard. Your I'm favorite... sorry, that's a bit boring. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's, that's the classic. That's my favorite. Yeah. Favorite pastry right now? Uh, are you a pastry guy? Or... Yeah, I am, but like it would probably just be a plain croissant. Yeah. You know, I love cannelle. Mm-hmm. Mm. Canelé, plain croissant, rhubarb and custard. That was delicious. Yeah. yeah. Rhubarb and custard has been a favorite combination of mine. Do you since like I buns? Do you kid. like the Scandinavian sort of cinnamon buns? I mean, I, I do and don't. I find them too sweet quite yeah. often. Yeah, yeah. They're quite sweet. Yeah. A lasting food memory. I don't know. What did you eat at your wedding uh, in Mexico? You know what? We didn't actually. Okay, so on my wedding day. Thanks for saving me with that. Mm. Uh, On my wedding day, Henry and I didn't eat the whole wedding. But luckily, in the morning, my friend, who's also going to be my head baker, she lives in the same... She moved there from here to open uh, my new bakery with Mm. me. Her name's Karishma. She's from Bombay. So the morning of my wedding day, she phones me up and says, Rich, do you want me to make you a biryani? Oh, wow. And I was like, yeah, we want you to make Mm. us a biryani. So like by midday, she had made us a biryani... And it comes up to our apartment in a big pot. And so, like, bef- before, while Henry and I were getting ready for the wedding, we both ate biryani. Mm. And that was the only thing we ate all day. Like, oh, the wedding wow. started at two in the afternoon and finished at two in the morning. Yeah. We just was too high and yeah. too enjoying ourselves yeah. to, it like, stop and so eat. It so beautiful. Yeah. I saw the pictures on We had lots of street food. We had tacos and... Mm. Um, tamales and all different street food coming throughout the the evening at different times but I was too busy dancing and socializing mm. and having fun yeah. and tea cocktails right tea cocktails yeah, yeah. 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 i made the tea cocktails yeah. my kids were like i wore like this japanese skirt that we bought when we were in japan yeah. last year and my kids were like why are you wearing a skirt <laughs> and i was like it's a japanese samurai skirt it's a guy's skirt and yeah. they're like it's a skirt. We why are you wearing a you. skirt? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And they were like, why don't you wear a suit like a normal guy? Yeah. And I'm yeah. like, I don't, I'm not a normal guy. I don't like wearing suits. And it's so beautiful because you and Henrietta, you were friends for a long time, right? Before very you, long before time. you became yeah. a couple. Yeah. Very long time. And like, so we know each other very well. Mm. Like, that's a good thing. Though. Yeah, it's very yeah. good. Like, mm. we, yeah, I think like it's really nice. Like, we know each other like deep in because we were good friends. There was yeah. nothing, no holding back. You know. Do you work well together? Uh, we do actually. Well, I don't know if we necessarily work together, like, but we do. We've done a lot of events together, and yeah. it goes really well. Yeah. Um. I mean, tea and bread is a, such a nice combination. It so is. we've done afternoon tea. We were in the Cayman Islands a couple of weeks ago, and we did an afternoon tea event, and it went so great. Mm. Like Henry is such a lovely host, and she's got so many amazing stories. And mm. I was cooking, making food for everyone and we were pairing it with her tea and it sounds wonderful. so yeah that goes yeah. well and then we're, if we're making dinner together in the kitchen we work so well together yeah. like we don't really t- have to talk about what you do this i do that you do that we just like do stuff and then we knock together amazing food yeah. where do you disagree about food uh, i don't think we do no 
I don't think we disagree about food. I think we're on the same level completely. And you both got the sort of British sort of foundation, right? I really from... love that we're both from England. Yeah. Like, I find it really nice that, that she's from England and mm. I'm from England. We have this, like, past of knowing the same mm. stuff, like crappy kids' cartoons yeah, and stuff yeah. like That's that. Yeah, that's a big There's thing. There's something yeah. about it. Yeah. yeah. Like, my ex-wife was American and mm. we didn't have the same humour. No. We didn't have the same... Quite difficult, actually. I know I'm English and Americans, we speak the same language, but we're very different mm. inside. I know what you mean. That's a big thing, that be yeah. able to remembering the same sort of kids' cartoons. It's silly, the silly stuff, culture. but like, yeah. yeah, the silly culture, the mm. silly candy, like weird stuff that mm. doesn't really mean anything, but it kind of does. Mm. Like, I'm really grateful that we're both mm. from England. You're yeah. so beautiful together. You can, yeah. you can actually see the love between the two of you. It's beautiful. Thank you. Thank Congratulations you. Yeah, thanks. again. Thanks. Um, so, Richard, uh, best and most used cookbook? Yeah, it's a good question. Like, I've used uh, Superiority Burger Cookbook a lot. Mm. I don't know if you know of it. No, like, I don't. it's a place in New York. It's a vegan, vegetarian, fast food burger diner. Oh, okay. It's it's a bit poply, but like not, you know, it's a yeah. vegan, vegetarian, but the food is amazing. The salads yeah. are amazing. You should get it. Like the burger, yeah, today. the burgers, <laughs> the burgers in it, the vegan vegetarian burgers, they're delicious. They're so good. Like yeah. it's such a weird thing to say, but they're so good. So it's funny actually, because I've just gone through, I being a chef for my whole life, I had a whole wall of cookbooks and moving mm. to Mexico. I mean, I was like, look, which ones do you actually need? Yeah. Though? Because yeah. I mean, we moved everything to Mexico and like going through them, I was like, you're right. Like, I don't need this. I don't. I had such a huge collection of yeah. all these like fancy famous restaurants that I'm never going to cook for me. No. And I've got it as a collection, but I was mm. like, why do I actually have these books anymore? Because mm. I'm never going to use them. So Superiority Burger is one I definitely use. There's another book that I think every human should read. He's a chef. He's got a restaurant in London. His name's Doug McMaster, mm. and his restaurant's called Silo. Oh, yeah, yeah. I've heard about that one. Yeah, and, Silo, his, yeah. and his book is food... Let me let me look at the name of his yeah. book because you know what? It's not so much a, that it's about his restaurant or his recipes. It's about his philosophy in, mm. in life. And I think everyone should read it. And after reading it, I changed. I changed. I, I bought a copy for all of my staff. Mm. Every one of my staff I bought a copy for. And I said, you should all read this. Basically, I... Um, well, what's his philosophy? He has, he has the only zero waste restaurant in the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so like basically, uh, it's called, there's, it's called silo, the zero waste blueprint. Oh, okay. A food system for the future. Mm. It's that his philosophy is if he can be completely zero waste, mm. everyone can be a little bit zero waste. Mm. So like, basically he has no bin. Mm. Everything is either compost or, uh, brought in everything that comes into the restaurant can be taken away mm. so if you bring in vegetables they come in a container that the container goes away again his wine bottles get ground down to fine sand and they turn them into plateware mm. like he has a box so i don't know like 20 centimeters by 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters that has the only garbage that the restaurant has had in 10 years and he's got like I mean, 10 things in there. And he wants to turn it into an art piece. Yeah. He like, says zero waste and he means it. He's yeah. really... Z like, yeah. there's no waste. Like, no. It's, a, it's the most amazing mental thing. And so after reading his book, I stopped using black bin liners in my bins. Mm. I was just wanting to try and do something to help yeah. the world yeah. a little bit. And I was like, well, imagine if every restaurant in the world, like the garbage truck comes along and it empties the dumpster into the back. It doesn't matter if they're in neat, tiny little plastic bags no. or not. Like, so we stopped using bin liners and just poured our bins into the dumpsters and then washed the bins up every mm. night. Seems to make sense, no? Yeah, like, it does. It but, does. like, everyone puts them in these neat plastic bags and ties them mm. up and takes them out. But imagine if no one had plastic bags, yeah. you would save so much plastic. Yeah. And we stopped using cling film, too, because... It's a huge waste and we were cling wrapping our croissant dough every day. Yeah. And we, we still use plastic. We use thick plastic bags that we use over and over and over again mm. until they get holes in. They don't last forever, but they last a lot longer mm. than a single use cling film 
So like I started trying to like have better practices from reading Doug's book. Oh, that's amazing yeah. when you get to read something that yeah. really sort of changes, changes you, you the way you look at things. tries to make you th- how to how can I be a better human? Yeah. How can I do something important that helps and so yeah, I wanted to make sure all my staff understood why I was making mm. these changes. And every time he comes to my bakery, I'm like, "No, don't look at that. Don't look at no. that. Please don't look at that because there's still like tons that could be done yeah. to be better but like that's the what about least, is, um, and that's why he says like that's why he says that i do it fully so you can do it a little bit yeah yeah, yeah. and be proud of what you're yeah, actually yeah, doing instead yeah, of what you're not yeah, doing yeah. yeah so richard last question um no actually two more questions <laughs> <laughs> so best food scene from a film book or a podcast uh the uh ratatouille where ratatouille the cartoon yeah where the rat is talking about putting this flavor and this flavor together and you eat them and then all these fireworks go off in your head. I don't know if you know that. Bit, I but know. Like, and you get so that hungry. That is the best yeah. food scene yeah. because like it's when I opened Heart Bakery, I had this idea of like, you know, I just want to fuck people up a little bit. Mm. And everyone was like, what? what are you talking about? And mm. I'm like, you know, I just want to fuck people up a little bit by they eat something and then they walk down the street and they're like forever changed. They're a bit like, did they do that or why did they do that or like how did you get it like that you know mm-hmm. like you constantly think about it for that moment on and that's a bit like that ratatouille moment yeah. you know where you eat this and you eat that and then you have all yeah. these fireworks Makes you think. going on yeah yeah that's my best food scene so this is yeah. the last question then tell me tell me a secret shit man <laughs> you know this is really funny because like maybe two months ago we were in london with my brother's nieces uh, and henrietta bought it was her she was nine years old and we bought her a book the book was like just a notebook mm. with a pen and i was like that's a shit present why are we buying her a notebook she's nine she doesn't want a fucking notebook mm. henrietta started this uh thing to her and she said look this is a notebook but like let's just write secrets in there and so the nine-year-old fell in love with this notebook mm. and like it was just basically like Henrietta, her and Henrietta shared a secret and then she came over to me. Henrietta went to the toilet and she was like, you'll never guess what Henrietta just told me. <laughs> <laughs> That's and, so cute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, what do you mean? And she, yeah. like, she just told me a secret. And, you know, <laughs> and then she told me. And we were, so for the rest of the day, we were having so much fun yeah. writing secrets. That's beautiful. But I don't know what to tell you. What secret did you write? I mean, I just wrote silly things that just to make her laugh. But I was mm. like, when I was a little kid, my sister, because she, obviously, oh, my sister's her aunt, and they're very close. When I was a little kid, my sister used to dress me up in her dresses and things <laughs> like that. Like, because yeah. she would what? Yeah. yeah. And then I would write, and your dad too. <laughs> you know, <laughs> what? Oh, but just different. silly things like that. I also like, I'm not very good at secrets. So someone yesterday said to me, "Can I tell you a secret?" And I'm like, "Look." I've just got to tell you, I'm really shit with secrets. Mm. So if you tell me a secret, I'm really likely to tell someone else. So you should, if you know that and you want to tell me, tell me. If you're not, don't tell me because I won't be able to keep it. And did they tell you? No. No. <laughs> That's a good thing. But it's good to be honest yeah, about yeah, that yeah. because I'm, I'm honestly so shit at I know, keeping that's secrets. knowing yourself. Yeah, yeah, I might as well be honest. Like, yeah. if you want to tell me, tell me, but you run the risk of me telling someone else yeah. because I can't keep them. Thank you so much, Richard, for yeah. taking the time. Thank yeah, you so okay. much. Yeah, thank you.